uh, tonight, um, uh, uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to have uh, Barry Shane here. Uh, I, I have had the pleasure of meeting him for the first time just uh, two or three hours ago, uh, but I've known of him, and uh, uh, we're glad to have him. Uh, partly because of him and partly because of the subject, as some of you know who have been following Clappy for a while, uh, we had a great uh, series of lectures on the Civil War uh, during the sesquicentennial years. Uh, we had usually two lectures each year. Uh, they're just a, a marvelous set of historians who specialize in the Civil War, so we were able to have uh, just a, a great program of uh, speakers. Um, uh, we're now doing, not as extensively, but we're, we're following Reconstruction. Uh, uh, and in fact, one of the people who was here who lectured on the, uh, the Battle of Gettysburg is uh, going to be lecturing in January on Reconstruction. So if that's a subject that interests you, uh, watch out for that. Uh, but we haven't done anything on the American Revolution, which uh, some people think was a fairly significant uh, event in uh, uh, American history. And so that is really... Uh, has been something that we have missed out on, uh, and I'm very glad that we're starting to remedy that tonight. Uh, uh, Barry Shane, uh, and this is something I uh, uh, found out uh, um, tonight, uh, he started his career uh, as an auto mechanic, I believe, uh, uh, which is interesting because he's the second lecturer we've had this year who's worked uh, in done that kind of line of work. Uh, the first, some of you may have heard uh, the lecture given by uh, Matthew Crawford uh, in March, I think. Uh, uh, that was a wonderful lecture, and uh, I hope we'll, I, I hope and expect that we will do uh, equally well uh, tonight. Uh, but then he sort of got onto a bad track, and he got himself a, a, a PhD in political science, uh, and uh, uh, entered into uh, an academic career. Uh, uh, which he has uh, pursued with distinction. Uh, he is, uh, and I won't go through everything, but uh, uh, he's uh, uh, one of the, maybe the book that is perhaps he's best known for is uh, called The Myth of American Individualism, The Protestant Origins of American Political Thought. Uh, he also um, uh, most recently, I think most recently, or certainly recently, uh, has published a, uh, uh, an important collection of documents uh, entitled uh, The Declaration of Independence in a Historical Context, uh, which I think will be a great service to students and scholars and others uh, uh, who are interested in that subject. Uh, he's a um, uh, professor at uh, uh, Colgate University, uh, and it is a pleasure for me to introduce him to you. Say anything else? Is there anybody who didn't get a handout? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. I'm, I'm from a liberal arts college. We do not have GAs, so we're, we're used to doing things. Somebody over here? Didn't get one? Everybody okay here? If I probably use, could use PowerPoint, I would, but I don't. While Barry's doing that, one thing I forgot to mention for those of you who are students, uh, there is a student club, the Claffey Student <coughs> Club, that works with us, helps us on a lot of things, but they also put on uh, some really great uh, <coughs> events of their own. If you are a student at UCLA and think that you would be interested in that, uh, Thomas Bowles, who's standing up there, uh, is the president of the student club and would be glad to give you uh, all the information you would like. Um, I should add that um, I'm from Los Angeles. I grew up around Los Angeles and Wilshire, so this is something to hope. I, I grew up in Los Angeles. I lived around Los Angeles and Wilshire, so this is something of a homecoming to me, for me. Um, I taught auto mechanics in San Francisco at community college level, and I um, still think that's an important part of my background. I was uh, uh, a graduate student in California and an undergraduate at Berkeley in 1968. That may tell you something also oh. <laughs> about my background. Um, 
I want to begin by thanking Professor Lowenstein and the Center for Liberal Arts and Free Institutions, and to my long, long time interlocutor, Professor Yurich, uh, for this opportunity to discuss with you this evening um, the nature of the American founding and important ways our understanding of core elements of our polity. Uh, with the election of our president elect Trump, some of these issues I think are going to become heightened again in ways they haven't been for some time. I, I provided each of you with a handout which um, should be something of a contract uh, between you and me. That is, that I, uh, I'd like to cover most of these areas at least somewhat. Um, I won't be able to do so as in full as, as I'd like. Um, given that in particular the seminar is something that has limited attendance, I'd hope and I'd like to turn this into a conversation as well, at least based on some of the comments I made and the handout as well. So I'm going to try to limit my remarks to 40 to 45 minutes at the most. Um, and I will look forward to you being in an interactive manner with me in terms of engaging these issues. They're ones that I think of interest to most American citizens. I won't go over the in any depth what I've handed out, but I'll just simply rehearse them very quickly. Um, I'm going to begin by discussing what I take to be the received wisdom regarding the American Revolution, more particularly the period leading up to it, which is known as the Imperial Crisis. Then I'm going to offer an alternative reading, which in fact is rather, well, different than the, the, the conventional understanding, in that I'm going to argue that the Americans did not want to, re, to separate from England. They wished to remain as part of an empire under a constitutional monarchy, and they viewed republics, and in fact democracy, as some kind of pathology. Uh, this was not something we entered into, and that's why the talk is the tragic American Revolution. They did not have a set of, of ready alternatives, and they accepted the fact that the Republic was maybe the only choice they had, but it wasn't something they sought. It wasn't something that, in fact, they, in fact, wished to, in fact, achieve. Um, I'm going to make this case by, in fact, making, making reference to a particular political theorist. Uh, I'm a political theorist who also works in history, um, named Eric Nelson, who has um, challenged the received wisdom in a ways that I think has done little service to this because he went too far. Hopefully I'm not going to make the same mistake. I'm also going to draw attention to the empirical school, empirical school of historians, something uh, which most people aren't aware of, and in particular the Dominion theory, which they argued was central to the American um, defense of their activities vis-a-vis -vis England. Um, I'm also going to talk about a number of different elements that I think support my understanding. And this will include that the, that the American independence movement was not a theoretical movement. It didn't result, it was not something, a product of challenging political theory. It was a constitutional crisis. What I mean by that is the Americans and their interlocutors in Britain and the, the differences between the populations and the, the colonies themselves, they did not disagree about what the right order was. The right order was a constitutional monarchy that in fact had elements that were traditionally known as the one, the few, and the many, which was the, the uh, king, the aristocracy, and the people. And that was the best alternative that in fact anyone had come up with. And this was an argument that had been made ever since, well, at least since Aristotle. So it wasn't something terribly new. But the Americans, um, the idea that it was constitutional rather than theoretical undercuts the argument that, in fact, they were trying to transform the nature, nature of the political institutions. What they wanted to do was maintain British models, not, in fact, to turn away from them. Um, this also argues that, in fact, that, that the idea that republicanism was an attractive alternative, I think, again, is little supported by the historical evidence. Um, the Americans, I'm also going to suggest, badly understood, and I think this is where Professor Yurish and I may disagree, badly understood the nature of the 18th century monarchy. Um, George III was not a tyrant. George III was a constitutional monarch that had little alternatives, and the colonists asked of him things that in fact were treasonous. Um, and what was particularly difficult was that the positions taken by the colonists were particularly irksome to the members of parliament who were Whigs. 
Americans turned out to be anything but Whigs. And what was particularly irritating is that they argued that they could provide money, requisitions to the king, without parliamentary oversight. I can't imagine anything closer to fighting words than what Americans had offered to the members of parliament in saying that they were going to free the king from basically parliamentary control. Um, and finally, or at least next to my last remarks, I'm going to argue why this, in fact, argument between <coughs> two schools of history matters. And then I'll turn to what I call the elephant in the room, which is trying to explain why the colonists in 1776, in spite of, or maybe um, in opposition to what I'm claiming, that they'd been actually reticent to, to adhere to republican institutions and sought to remain part of the constitutional monarchy. Um, then I'll finish with a few remarks about which in some ways embody my irreverent take both on the Declaration of Independence and the fe Federal <coughs> State Constitution. I'll try to quickly go over the, ma the um, master narrative, which I think is dominant in late 20th century uh, history, and that in fact continues today, and is to be is supported by and disseminated by almost all American cultural institutions. Um, it's remarkable, there was a historiographical revolution in the 1980s and 90s, it, among historians, it was called the Republican Revolution. It made no impact, I actually worked on this, it made no impact on American high school textbooks. It just, like, it was an argument by American historians. American public opinion didn't know anything about it. America, may, maybe there was a, a group of political theorists who became something called communitarians who were affected by it. But in the whole, the kind of teapot, tempests that in fact historians are engaged in has very little impact on changing the nature of what is disseminated by Americans in their cultural, normal cultural means. The memes are in fact almost re absolutely resistant to in fact to historical disconfirmation regardless of how badly they're constructed. I'm going to attack this normal understanding of the American uh, war for independence or at least the, the impetus that led up to it and what I'm going to do a little bit, which is going to be even unorthodox for uh, those who are unorthodox, is I'm going to lump together liberalism and republicanism in that I find that debate between these schools of thoughts in the 1980s somewhat artificial. Um, people made their living in, on basically making this case, but it's I ironic given that the central author, who in fact was um, principal to both arguments, <coughs> is John Locke. How is it that one guy could both be on both sides? Um, I'm going to suggest liberal and republicanism go together. What I mean by republicanism is a body of thought that believes that government can be uh, best instituted without a king. It came in aristocratic and democratic var variants. The American was a democratic republicanism. And liberalism is one you're kind of familiar with. It argues that people should have rights. It argues that people have dignity. And it basically attends to the individual. There's a tension. <coughs> Democracy is concerned with corporate good. And liberalism is concerned with individual <coughs> good. So there's nothing inherently compatible about them. Yet I still think that, in fact, one can put them together. Um, it's hard to imagine in a culture like 18th century America, that was rife with slavery ra and radical inequalities of all kinds, even among putatively equal white males, that in fact we can argue that it was a liberal regime. Um, it just doesn't make sense. And yet we seem to make this case without any sort of qualms that in fact <coughs> what we're saying has some sort of inherent incoherence. Um, I'm going to continue to argue that the mainstream historians of the late 20th century Things have changed a little bit over the last uh, decades. But in particular, people like Louis Hart, <coughs> Richard Hofstetter, Bernard Balin, mostly got it wrong. Um, in short, according to this well-accepted story that I find so many ways unconvincing, it was because the colonists were dissatisfied with the British constitutional monarchy, in line with the arguments advanced by big inspired defenders of parliamentary supremacy, something that makes, again, no sense and that they wish to put in place a more or less democratic republic in form of government that, that is this, the re, this is the reason they rebelled and declared the independence from Great Britain. About none of that, do I th almost none of that do I think is true. Americans did not seek a republic. They did not in fact reject monarchy, at least until 
April or May of 1776. For 12 years they argued that the central problem was parliamentary tyranny, parliamentary in, uh, us usurpation, parliamentary, everything that in fact had to do with parliament was viewed as an abomination. The king, on the other hand, was their succor. The king was to save them. The king was their father. The king was the person who was to intervene. This is where Nelson goes a little too far. He doesn't pay attention to the Americans who have been playing the king for almost a century. But nonetheless, this is the arguments they advanced. My alternative narrative is that much of this has gone wrong, and that, in fact, if we look at the works, and to, if we look at both what was said in the Continental Congresses, starting with the Albany Congress in 1754, and the major uh, pamphlets of the period from 1764 to 1776, the colonist opposition was not to the king, it was to Parliament. It was to Parliament's innovation in trying to sit back, rationalize the imperial administration, which was mainly, in fact, the central issue that, in fact, they were opposed to. It was not driven by political philosophy. It was driven by constitutional conundrums, which I'll get to later. Weak thought, at its core, and I, I think it's indisputable, if weak thought means anything, it's parliamentary supremacy. What was it that, in fact, the Americans opposed? Parliamentary supremacy. So the arg argument that, in fact, they were good Whigs in this Republican li uh, liberal line, this fundamentally makes no sense. There's an inherent contradiction, and yet we seem to pay no attention to it. Based on my reading of the past two decades and my current exploration of political pamphlets, I believe I can demonstrate that Balin, along with defenders of other, ortho other Orthodox liberal Republican schools, are wrong. They're wrong in contending that the majority of colonists, most importantly those who gathered these intercolonial bodies, sought to leave the British Empire and sought to, in fact, destroy a constitutional monarchical <coughs> government. Eric Nelson in, wrote a book in 2014, which in some ways shares certain um, similarities to my work, and so does Brendan McConville in his book in 2006. I won't go into depth on Eric Nelson's excesses, and they're abundant. But still, his, his basic stance that the colonists <coughs> were most opposed to Parliament and, and that it had overreached, and they turned to the king, and so turning, they turned to royalist arguments of a kind that even the prime minister of England recognized as being more Tory and more royalist than that advanced by, in fact, the members of parliament. Um, Nelson gets much right, but he goes too far in arguing the fact that the colonists didn't <coughs> believe that if they simply were to advance this argument, that they would be happily under the sort of um, the control of George III. That wasn't the case. What they knew and had a hundred years of experience is they'd been able to control monarchical excesses in the colonies to a great deal. Nelson was also right, in fact, that much of the um, royalist propensities did not die in 1776, but continued to shape thinking. And in the Philadelphia Convention of 87, what you find is, in fact, a number of thinkers, if, if you part of the seminars reading that we're going to talk about tomorrow, uh, Saturday, is that a number of the thinkers there, people who we regard today as the founding fathers, continue to believe that the best government in the world was Britain's. Why? Because it, in fact, was balanced. It balanced between the one, the king, the few, the aristocracy, and the many. Americans' government was always imperfect. Why was it imperfect? What did it always lack? The mediating element between the one and the many. Only the aristocracy was capable of resisting the king and of resisting the people because of the particular location and particular sense of themselves. Americans never had an aristocracy, so it was always, in fact, in terms of a balanced constitution, even at the best, imperfect. More important to my thinking, and I, th I imagine to Professor Yurich, Nelson's, and any number of people who disagree <coughs> on a number of subjects, is the thinking of a particular school of thought that's in the 1920s. The 1920s was a particular time. There was a certain kind of liberty 
much of our thinking about the, the American Revolution and the founding, I think is guided by political <coughs> sensibilities and that they serve particular they serve particular ends that, are, in fact, are treated as icons today. The 1920s had a certain kind of liberation, a certain kind of freedom. Uh, it's not surprising, then, that these historians in the 1920s, in particular a man named Charles McElwain, who wrote in 24, The American Revolution, that they, in fact, argued in ways that, what, that had never been, in fact, the case before or after. According to the school of thought, that which my research follows and that I continue to believe is in fact the most uh, useful in understanding the period between 1764 and 1776, until forced to embrace some manner of republicanism in 1776 as a result of, as is the case with all tragic ends, a lack of ready alternatives, the most articulate voices among the colonists evidence no wish to end their subordination to the king in pursuit of republican institutions while simultaneously rejecting any subjection to another people, an equal people, that they understood to be the constituents of the House of Commons. Central to this account, the most powerful line of argument advanced by colonial apologists is what is called the Dominion Theory, in which the colonists view themselves as living outside the realm of Great Britain, over which Parliament legitimately enjoyed supremacy, even absolutely so, but outside of which Parliament enjoyed no such power, in particular over the king's personal dominions. <clears throat> this led to a very curious debate in England and between the colonists. <clears throat> the American position as advanced under this dominion theory was that we were feudal, basically subjects of the king without, in certain sense, any degree of, of in fact, English rights. We were, in fact, in a feudal relationship with our lord. And according to this theory, the parliament had no role. We were, it was a particular relation with a particular man, not with, in fact, a country. And this is what they argued, this was what they argued, is why Parliament had no role in governing. British members of Parliament view this as enormously bizarre. Why? They valued highly, and rightly so, English rights. But according to this theory, if, the, if their basic view was, right, was correct, Americans had no such rights because they were not part of the English nation. This gets complicated because Americans argued frequently from out of both sides of their mouth. Uh, coherence wasn't a high, uh, some, wasn't something particularly valued. So they defended English rights, <coughs> but under what grounds? Without Parliament? From Parliament's perspective, it made no sense. How can you have English rights without Parliament's, in fact, supremacy? According to this theory is endorsed by the most articulate colonial offenders, for example, John Adams in his 1773 exchange with Thomas Hutchison, the North American British colonies had never been incorporated in the British realm, except Ill illegally in 1640s by Parliament, and to this, even as late as the Glorious Revolution and well beyond, the American British continental colonies claimed they had never consented. The particular legal history and arguments having to do with dominion theory is, is rather complex, depends on close readings of both domestic English, natural, and international law. But in brief, according to its colonial defenders, as highlighted by the Imperial School historians, including important internecine differences among them, and their later day adherents, it was through this logic that Parliament was importantly viewed as lacking any legitimacy to legislate for the colonies, while the king, acting constitutionally, and with colonial legislatures at his side, did enjoy such power. Let me be clear. What the colonial apologists defended in speech and intercolonial bodies and in print in a large number of, mo of the most influential pamphlets that they published, though of course not all, was that the colonists were directly under the rule of the king, but in no manner subject to parliamentary oversight, except regarding trade, which they viewed as a matter of their accommodating generous spirit. Rather exceptionally then, the colonists were defending a position that was opposite defended by Whig apologists in the 17th, 18th centuries, including most notably, though in, in, in complex ways, the ubiquitous John Locke, and looks, that looks far closer as contended at the time, again by the Prime Minister Lord North, to be closer to Tory and Royalist arguments than that of Whigs. It's hard to make sense of the position, of the position argued by uh, the late 20th century historians, 
when they are, when they understand or when one understands that it was opposition to Parliament that drove the American colonial position, not opposition to the king. Let me emphasize now a number of disparate elements that add to my sense that the master narrative is far from getting it right in arguing that the majority of the continental colonies actively sought to leave the empire to be free from anarchical government while embracing intentionally some manner of Republican democratic government. These disparate elements include my sense that the discourse leading to the independence moves was constitutional, not theoretical, that the colonies had a flawed and exaggerated understanding of the independence of the 18th century British monarchy, and they paid insufficient attention to the history that had led, the kings being led to the kings being constrained and how members of parliament continued to fear that this might be undone. The arguments of the colonists were, in, were of such a nature that the members of parliament could not, in fact, endorse them, could not accept them because of the fear that, in fact, they were trying to undo or would undo the basic control that they, in fact, developed over the British executive over prerogative powers, something that in fact had never been done before. Americans threatened liberty. Among these disparate elements that adds the strength to the alternative narrative of defending is the fact that from 1762 until 1776, the years of the imperial crisis that led to the colonial war for independence, many of the political activists and their opponents in the colonies of Great Britain shared the same vision of the best political institutional arrangements. They didn't differ. That is, a, that is, constitutional monarchy as developed in Great Britain was the norm, and accordingly, their differences were not theoretical, one being monarchist and the other being Republican, though there were both elements in England. Tom Paine, for example, was a Brit, and he hated monarchy. But the, their differences were merely constitutional. That, that is, how to put in place in an imperial system the norms that, in fact, were British and that, in fact, respected parliamentary supremacy. It's not to say that they hadn't solved these problems in, 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 in actual living, but they didn't have theoretical ways of describing them. They didn't have a language. This is important as it adds weight to the colonists who are not striving to put in place a new political order. Quite the contrary. It was England and Parliament that was striving to put in place a new political order. Of course, coming up with a constitutional solution, given the necessity of Parliament's maintaining control over its king, of the king, proved difficult, if not impossible. What were the core constitutional conundrums facing men of goodwill on both sides of the Atlantic, of which there were very many? They were, one, how to maintain parliamentary supremacy, which was the absolute essential uh, uh, um, demand of, parliament, of members of Parliament they had to maintain their supremacy, the essence of Whig political thought. Uh, and they, but they sought to do so in an imperial setting about which they had no, in fact, blueprint. Two, how to articulate it had already been done in practice for a century in some places, an imperial federalism that would preserve parliament supremacy along with the associated political rights of British subjects and peoples. These are not issues of political theory concerned with the right kind of political order or the best regime. This was agreed upon. It was a constitutional monarchy. This is, these are issues of constitutions. How to apply what they already accepted as the right and good. Yet due to political obstacles, a failure of imagination on both sides, and the sheer difficulty of finding solutions acceptable to all parties, solutions to these constitutional con conundrums were not forthcoming. One man, Joseph Galloway, came close, but only close. I might mention, too, that the colonies were, would quickly confront another long-lived constitutional challenge that they only with difficulty overcame. This is the third conundrum, which concerns a national federalism, and this would, they, would begin, they began to address in 1754 and rejected it, but it would come up again in 1787-88, and some form of solution would be offered then, in many ways, the solution would only come in 1764 with the defeat of the South. I'd also like to mention as one of these, these issues that, in fact, are part of the reason I think that, in fact, the traditional historiographical graph account is wrong, is how the Americans understood the king. They understood the king more or less as the king understood himself in relation to Hanover, Germany, which was... It was actually in the middle of the 18th century that the last king ever appeared in battle um, during the thir uh, thir uh, uh, 
seven years war that would turn out, in, at least in Central Europe, to be nine years. Um, he appeared in battle in the 1760s, um, early uh, 1750s, excuse me. Um, George II was, in fact, the last king to appear in battle, um, fighting over his, his, in fact, hereditary lands. The idea that the king could, in fact, prove as a savior for the American colonists from basically parliamentary intrusion, parliamentary tyranny, just made no sense. That king no longer existed. The last time a British king had, in fact, vetoed legislation, want to guess? Anyone? 1740. What? 1750. 1707, Queen Anne. Um, last time that a British monarch ever vetoed a piece of legislation, 1707. Um, the king basically was a constitutionalist. He was beginning to develop a, a party governance. He was de developing what we now in political science call a responsible party system. Um, and what the colonists asked him was, in fact, to abrogate the British Constitution in meeting their demands. He refused to. He w there would have been a constitutional crisis, and he would have been probably found guilty of some form of treason if he, in fact, followed the, the colonists' aspirations. They wanted him to be their king. He was no longer the king in council. He was the king in parliament. The idea that you could separate parliament from the king in the 1770s made no sense. Closely aligned with the colonists' flawed understanding of British monarchy, what made the imperial crisis so difficult to resolve was the way in which the colonists' de defense of the dominion theory made it nearly <laughs> impossible for parliamentary friends of the colonies to accommodate them in their demands. What I have in mind is the colonists, by advancing their understanding of their unitary relation between them and the king, along with the right to provide him, when requisitioned, funds not approved by parliament, threatened a hundred years of British constitu constitutional and legal development, which by almost all accounts had produced the finest instantiation of political liberty in the history of the world which though parliamentary control, through parliamentary control of the purse, that in fact the Americans were challenging. It was just that the colonists, inadvertently or not, threatened as when Ben Franklin in February 13, 1766, appearing in the well of, of the house, argued the following. When asked how the colonists would respond if the king were, were to, quote, require the colonists to grant a revenue that, that, par that the parliament should be against their doing, do they think that they can grant a revenue to the king without consent of Parliament of Great Britain? To which Franklin, a very clever fellow, whatever else he was, to, he responded incredibly that it was likely that they, they could do so if they wished to. It's hard to imagine fighting words that were more, in fact, incendiary than that. This is what it took in 100 years. In fact, it makes it and not would turn the British, the British constitutional system into a marvelous anomaly. They control executive prerogative through, in fact, control over budgetary means. And what did the colonies basically threaten? To pay the king privately and separately so that, in fact, parliamentary control would be undermined. This made it very difficult for the friends in, par in Parliament of the colonies to, in fact, support them. Even Burke, until late in the 1770s or even 1780s, refused to surrender this point as much as he was, in fact, he was the agent of the New York colony, as much as he supported, in fact, many of the American aspirations. But he would not surrender this. Let me ask, why should anyone care which of these accounts that which is um, that which is widely accepted, and that which I presented is right. Why do we care? What's at stake? I'd suggest a great deal. That is the very nature of understanding of the American colonial resistance movement and its denouement in the colony separation from Great Britain. <coughs> its aim, its intentions, and whether or not the ends achieved was in any manner, any manner what had been uh, sought. Importantly, this alternative historiography recasts our understanding of the colonial and early national perspectives on the merits and demerits of British constitutional monarchy, and more importantly, the extent to which republicanism and democracy were positively sought ends versus an unsought tragic outcome. 
I imagine many in California may have second thoughts about democracy given the recent elections. Still more importantly, this view of the independence movement and its culmination does much, I believe, to transform how we view the foundational American relationship to democracy, what might have been understood by many, if not most, in the founding generation, to be less a cure to monarchy than the disease that, that within a republic form of government would need to be cured itself. And the need for strong executive leadership. These are issues that I'd suggest as are as relevant today as at any time in American history. Let me talk about the, what I'm going to claim is the elephant in this room. Not only must I explain what is at stake, but possibly st still more importantly, before in any manner persuading you that the majority of articulate colonists in the 1760s and 70s were in truth not aspiring Republicans, Enlightenment liberals, or leveling Democrats, I must make sense of the fact that almost overnight in 1776, most of the colonies formed relatively democratic Republican governments that, that according to my narrative, had been both unanticipated and unsought by most of the same population for the preceding 12 years. If you will, it's incumbent on me to explain how or why the colonists in 1776 rapidly moved from supporting British constitutional monarchy to the creation and support of Republican democratic state governments. This, if I am right about the preceding dozen years, is a most vexing challenge, and because of it, I owe you an explanation of what I surmise were the supporting changes that occurred in the political climate of the North American British continental colonies. All those adjectives are needed to describe the population I have in mind. Great. How many colonies were there in North America, British colonies? Uh, more than 13. Um, 30? Possibly, yeah. Yeah, about yeah. 30, I think. Um, Oh, which, yeah, including the Caribbean, right? The right. Whole, yes, yes. The whole America. Yeah. That's part of America. Yeah. <laughs> like Canada's part of America. <laughs> so great things, anyway. Yes. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it seems fair enough. I mean, by the way, part of this argument is if there were an American war for independence, what would have happened? What is the tragedy or the sad, horrible event that would have occurred? Well, one thing, probably slavery wouldn't have ended in 1832 in, in the British Empire. That's one of the horrible things. But what's the other horrible thing? You'd be seeking help of the, uh, help of the Queen and we'd be part of the Commonwealth. Well, do you still do hell of the Queen? <coughs> no. They ended in the like, 50s or 60s? Right. Yeah, we'd all be Canadian. <laughs> Just, I mean, I, I know that's, of course, a very scary uh, idea. Well, we might get along better. <laughs> <laughs> My explanation for what I admit was a truly monumental change likely will not immediately convince you, but still that doesn't make it untrue even if it is yet un incomplete. I do understand this is my challenge. What I'd like to suggest, though, is that the changes that summer had very little to do with antecedent political goals shaped either by liberal or Republican political philosophy, or at least not directly, but instead, one, the changing social landscape of 18th century America, two, the British government's clumsy handling of a decade of colonial opposition and its wartime excesses. Three, the misguided confidence of colonial elites in thinking they could control their opposition efforts, uh, effects on social hierarchy. And four, something hard to pinpoint or even discuss, but nevertheless, from my mind, ever so real, the sense of love denied that came to describe the colonist rejection by the king in whom they placed their trust and love. They believed, I contend, that the king had unfairly found them not worthy of his love, and that he had instead preferred, if you will, chosen to love, if you will, his English people more than his American ones. Thus, at least in some part, I'd ask you to consider that the story of the American movement towards independence is a story of love unrequited. And as we all know, love when unrequited can ever so quickly turn to something else. Moreover, let me add, rapid transformations in political sentiments are not all that rare in American history or elsewhere. Consider, for instance, the equally monumental shift in popular colonial sentiment regarding the French Catholic kings from one of fear, contempt, and hatred for more than a century to one of trust, adulation, if not love, then something close to it all in the course of a decade or less. Similar stories can be told about the changes in American history in, the, in 1828, the 1860s, 
1890s, 1930s, 1960s, and yes, almost certainly true in the wake of the Trump victory of 2016. The world can change rapidly and quickly in ways that are unanticipated and difficult to make sense of. Finally, it seems incumbent on me in closing to say something about, ever so briefly, about the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Concerning the former, although it was the product of a dozen years of bickering and finally the beginning of military hostilities between Great Britain and a number of her continental American colonies, it was a document whose main thrust was directed against the king, I understand that too, and consequently it shared little in common with the thought of the more respected authors who in Congress and in pamphlets for a dozen, dozen years had defended the cause against Parliament, not the king, while turning the king for succor. The Declaration, let me not, let me not be misunderstood, it did give birth to a new American discourse that was not in keeping with the goals prominent colonists had articulated, at least those that were prominent, for over a dozen years. I should add there was an enormous divide as well between the New England colonies and Virginia on one side, not opposed, slavery wasn't the issue, the New England colonies and Virginia on one side, and on the opposite side, the middle colonies. It was the middle colonies that, in fact, resisted uh, the turn towards independence most uh, strongly, along with South Carolina. It was New England and, and Virginia, in my mind, for very different reasons. One for more secular and the other more religious reasons. Both embraced republicanism, <coughs> one of, a, again, a deeply religious sort. But it was opposed by the majority, and the majority was the middle colonies, who, in fact, had no, tr had no confidence in this change and even some in New England, like John Adams, would quickly discover that, in fact, his confidence was probably misplaced. Um, the Declaration Let Me Not Be Understood did, did give birth to a new American discourse that was not in keeping with the goals that, in fact, I've been describing. The colonists thus, in classically tragic ways, were able to sustain the relationship to the king. It was only after this failure that, in the Declaration, this would be turned to a sought-after success. It wouldn't be the first or last time that those who we've come to call Americans had or would do so, that is, change failure into success by redefining what, in fact, their goals were. We've done this repeatedly, repetitively. We once wanted to be a religious people that then became a communal people. We were a communal people that then became a familiar people. We were a familiar people that became uh, an individualist people, and now we're in fact taking individualism apart as well. We successively change our goals and then redefine them so that we always achieve success even in the jaws of failure. In the new world following the issues of the Declaration, British and individual and corporate rights will be replanted in the fertile soil of universal rights. The distinction between civil and natural rights, a really important distinction, would soon come to be corroded and the close linkage between rights and duties, they too began to be ignored. The Declaration is short, the one that in fact were, were at least at the end of the, of the period I'm mostly talking about, gave birth to a world with, with which we are all very familiar. And the Federal Constitution, which I have something to say about as well, they would immediately do much to limit the democratic excesses of the states in the decade preceding its adoption in surprising ways in ways that we just don't want to accept. It's not part of our hagiographic self-adulation. That the American Constitution and the state constitutions actually were not forward-looking, they were backward-looking. They, in fact, turned to, in fact, the period of the Glorious Revolution to put in place a form of government that, in fact, was adversarial between executive and legislature. While the rest of Europe was moving in new directions, it was moving in the direction of parliamentary control with a prime minister that, in fact, reflected the, the goals of the majority party, and the party in majority could be replaced by elections. It's called responsible party government. What happened in 2010 in America, which led to, in fact, the continued um, governing by a president that no longer had support in the legislature, in fact, he ruled outside of legislative means, would have been impossible in a parliamentary system and would have been impossible in the system, in fact, Britain was already putting in place. We, in fact, envisioned a system that, in fact, looks back to the 1690s, 
a vision which in fact is only in fact suitable or most suitable for a king, a king to be opposed by popular government and the legislature. Uh, the idea of, of in fact the executive will work with the legislature is in fact the norm throughout the Western world, except us. Our <coughs> constitution then wasn't a move forward, it was a move backwards. I hope that this talk, if nothing else, will in fact provoke you to reconsider some of the assumptions you make about the movement towards American separation from Britain, possibly the Declaration, and at least to consider that maybe the Constitution isn't the end and be all of, uh, of constitutional um, institutional arrangements. Uh, I think if you think carefully about the predominance of parliamentary su uh, supremacy in Whig thought, it's hard to imagine how to in fact conceive of the American War of Independence as being predominantly Whiggish. The Whigs, in fact, had overcome the king through parliamentary supremacy, not the other way around. If you consider how much the Americans turned, again, uh, there's some overstatement in some of the contemporary works that push the same line. How much the Americans turned to the king for his, in fact, support, his help against parliament, um, it's hard to imagine that the view we generally um, promulgate that the Americans wish to remove the king and wanted to replace it with popular government, it just doesn't make sense. <clears throat> there's nuances, there's complexities, there's difficulties in all theories and all accounts. But I think the overall impression that I'm hope I hope you at least are willing to consider is that maybe the story that everyone tells that seems supportive of how we want to understand ourselves isn't in fact factual and isn't in fact historical. It's more a reflection of the, of the kind of founding myths that every country has that makes them feel good. But in, in, in the realities that we confront today, in the tensions between strong executive leadership that we're about to experience and the difficulties of democracy, wouldn't it make sense to try to get the American history right so we can understand at least where we came from. Thank you. We, I, I, I think I stayed close to about 40 minutes. There we go. Um, and we should have lots of time. What time do we have the room for? Well, we'll, we'll just see how it goes. I, I mean, we always get out of here by 9.30, but we're usually up by about 9.00. Okay, if you guys ask questions, I'll answer them, and we'll keep him here. <laughs> so, a question. Um, I, this is a, these are topics I don't know. It's going to be a little bit louder. These are topics I'm really I don't know quite as good as hold on. much as you do. But I'm having... I'm Wait, hold on again. I'm going to come a little closer, because okay, otherwise sure. I, I'll have you screaming. All right. So, it's a, it, it was a great talk. And it's, uh, I mean, it's a wonderful talk, because it's so... Contrarian, uh, in, in some ways unsettling. What I'm having problems wrapping my arms around is that there were other forms of contemporaneous literature that, you know, to my knowledge, uh, however limited it is, seem to suggest a different uh, hypothesis. And my understanding is Thomas Paine, uh, in Common Sense, was highly critical of monarchy. He's English. Right. Okay. I mean, in but, fact, there, there were more radicals, more radical hostility to monarchy in England. I mean, England knew about how, what a pain in the ass the king actually was. I mean, he was 3,000 miles away. We could, in fact, speculate, we could think about what a nice king he is. He had almost no power. I mean, I remember being a department chair and thinking, now I understand what it's like to be a colonial governor. I have no carrots, and I have no sticks. <laughs> Anybody else have been chair? <laughs> Does that sound familiar? Um, the king in England actually had sticks and carrots. The king's representative, the governor, in the, in the colonies, and sometimes the upper chambers, they had very little sticks, and they certainly had very little few carrots. So we could imagine, and this is where I think Nelson gets it wrong. Does this seem fair, Craig? I mean, we could imagine that, that we can have all kinds of fantasies about monarcho government because it was so weak in the colonies. I mean, the Privy Council played a role. It would actually serve as an adjudicator between squabbles in the colonies. But the king did not have the same power 
here as they have there. So we can, in fact, fantasize about royal government monarchy in opposed to the much more powerful and dangerous, from our point of view, a parliament. But, I mean, it made sense to be anti-monarchical, made more sense to be anti-monarchical in England than it did in the colonies. Because the king was basically, you know, I was going to say somewhat neutered, but not very strong. But I mean, Thomas King translated himself to the Americas. We were all British then, and so to say he was British. He was, we were all British, but he was English. <coughs> well, <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, so, I'm, so, so my understanding is Burke was critical of the French Revolution, but supportive of the American Revolution. To a degree. And he then, thought that we'd, gotten a we'd made a mistake by talking about, that everybody on both sides had gotten and made a mistake by talking about theory. theory. Right. We should have just ignored theory, we should have fixed the things, and gotten back to, in fact, making money. Okay, so, this is, so I'm, not actually, I'm not actually making an argument here. I, I just actually have a, a question, because I don't know the answer to this. This is a, a genuine inquiry. So my understanding is one of the reasons Burke was critical of the French Revolution is because it, it was essentially an overturning of some type of pre-established system of formal and informal norms that uh, had credibility through its history, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, whereas Burke was supportive of the American Revolution because it was a re-articulation of essentially, I mean, this is where I thought you were going to go with this, where it would support your argument, was it was essentially a re-articulation articulation of English values, but if what you're claiming is true, and the American Revolution was very Toryish, uh, as being critical of parliamentary control or over control, then it seems to me Burke, and this is the question, I, I mean, I could be totally wrong about this, it seems to me Burke would have been also critical of the American Revolution unless you're claiming Burke was a Tory. No, he wasn't a Tory, but he was a Whig. And he was critical of the American Revolution, but he was less critical than most of his colleagues. Um, he felt that, in fact, the, 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 the we, I mean, Burke was the author of one of the most um, um, difficult um, acts opposed on the American colonies. He was the author under the Grenville administration. It wasn't something um, that, in fact, we, we, rom we romanticized Burke in his role. Um, Burke was, in fact, a Whig, and Burke was never surrendered the supremacy of, in fact, Parliament, and he never, never surrendered the necessity of supremacy over the king. In fact, Burke was particularly, in fact, exemplary of exactly what I have in mind, is, in fact, that the colonists threatened, in fact, the basic establishment that Parliament had achieved in controlling the king. I mean, if Burke, if Burke was going to issue his tendencies, then, I mean, what am I missing here? Why wouldn't you have been more critical of the Americans if, in fact, he was... There were, lots of, you know, there were lots of views. Hume and Adam Smith and Dean Tucker both said, these people were totally pain in the asses. Cut them loose. We'll make more money off them with them not having any suspicion. I mean, the basic claim, the basic fear of the Brits were that if they lost their piggy bank, things were going to go awry. It turns out they got rid of a bunch of Meshuganas and their piggy bank came Professor, if I understand your theory, uh, the colonist beef was with Parliament rather than the King. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. But isn't it the case of Declaration of Independence, which has this long list of grievances, most of it's a list of grievances in terms of the content. Those are all, aren't most of those directed at the king rather than parliament? Yes, sir. Okay, then why, then isn't that inconsistent with your theory that the colonists be with parliament, not the king, if the Declaration of Independence is directed to the king? It's a great question, and it's exactly on target. Um, the colonies had basically had um, a beef with the king up until, well, the first half of the 18th century. Because the only difficulties they had was with British government, and British government was the king and his, in fact, representatives. Between seven, the period in which I'm talking, this particular period, 1760s and 1770s, it wasn't with the king. It was with Parliament. 
Why is the declaration written? The declaration contains more or less two sort of sets of indictments. One are old stuff, stuff that occurred in the 1720s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and new stuff, stuff that occurred in the 1770s because of a British occupation, British forces, and the basic difficulties the king found himself in. It's not surprising the declaration is couched the way it is because the colonists never accepted that Parliament had any right, any right legitimately to, in fact, exercise control over them. This is a declaration of independence. From whom? Parliament? They never had any right. They never had any relationship, at least according to their theory. It was a declaration of independence from the only legitimate power over them, the king. And they'd fallen out of love with him. In fact, there was, it was actually worse than that. In the American Prohibitory Act, he had, in fact, made American colonists subject, in fact, um, being impressed in the British Navy, but impressed in a way that was voluntary, such that if they were, in fact, to, re to in fact, uh, try to escape, they, it would be capital. But that um, supports the argument that, uh, that the colonists' beef was with the king. They saw the king as the head of the government. They didn't want this government telling them what to do. And for 12 years, they had Then they would do things like, uh, you know, impose taxes, which they didn't want. He People didn't want impose taxes. Alone. Parliament they did. Saw the king. They saw the king as a personification <coughs> of a government that they didn't like. I would just disagree. In fact, there was almost nothing of that for 12 years. All they did was ask the king for his protection and protection from Parliament. The reason the Declaration is couched the way it is is because they did not see they did not perceive Parliament as ever having any legitimate right. And who were they, in fact, declaring the independence from? Some, it's like saying the Americans are going to declare the independence from, I don't know, um, South, uh, Venezuela. What for? It, made no, it would have made no sense. They declared independence because the king, from their logic, and there's a certain degree of strength in this point, he had unkinged himself. Because loyalty was dependent on protection. The king was no longer protecting us, so we no longer owed him loyalty. The Declaration is not reflective of the movement for the previous 12 years, which was entirely with Parliament. The only reason this matters is to try to make sense of what it is that for those 12 years, American colonists sought at least the majority as represented in the Continental Congresses. And what they <coughs> sought was the continuation of the British Empire continuation of a monarchical government, and in fact, they never had shown any particular love. In fact, they were scared to death of what the, the dangers were of Republican Democratic government. They couldn't, in fact, maintain the one they sought because the king had unkinged himself. He had shown he didn't love us. He didn't want to protect us from another people. They viewed Parliament as, in fact, a competitor. It was just <coughs> another one of the king's people. And they, their view was the king could have lots, it's like you know, a father with lots, you know, with sort of multiple wives. He can have lots of different children with lots of different women. And they basically viewed Sorry. that, in fact, he was preferring one woman and his, his ch and her children to them. Oh, it, it, some of what you just said. The king was symbolic, and there were many petitions to the king. And he didn't, and he couldn't respond or didn't respond, and Parliament didn't respond to these petitions to the king. Well, the Parliament didn't respond not to the petitions to the king, they didn't respond to petitions to them. The reason, and Burke was one of the people who in fact intentionally made sure, along with American, other American agents, that in fact Parliament never saw our, our petitions. Why? Because they would have been inflammatory. Because what we claimed is that Parliament had no right over us. I mean, can you imagine what this, how this Parliament would have responded if we sent them those petitions? Not well. And the ones the king, we frequently, we, when we petitioned the king, often the timing was particularly bad. We just killed a bunch of British soldiers, or okay. any number of them. Timing was almost always very bad. And the king was in, he was in a very awkward position. He could not do other than he did, or at least he had very limited range, because he was a constitutional monarch, and he was a British king in Parliament. But not on this outside. side of the Atlantic, the colonists didn't look at it that way. We agree. They didn't look at it that way. But that king that they looked at did not exist. The king independent of parliament, except maybe in the Sandwich Islands and in 
uh, Hanover, that king did not exist. The king that existed in England in the mid 18th century was a king that in fact could not govern any of in fact, this is the debate between realm and dominion. The colonists wanted to argue that they were part of the king's personal dominions, not part of the realm over which in fact parliament exercised sovereignty. Was there any, because uh, I don't recall reading about it, but was there any indication that the colonists wanted to become, in essence, members of parliament, have rep direct representation? Um, there, was some, there was some discussion of that, but most of them were too smart to get tricked into that because they would be sending over however large a contingent, it would be too small, in fact, then whatever legitimacy that was lacking in Parliament's exercise of sovereignty or exercise of power of them would and then have legitimacy and they'd lose. Almost all, I mean, almost all the colonists, even those who end up being loyalists, many of them, in fact, refused to accept that. Sir, maybe there's questions over here. Sorry. I understand what you're saying, the fact that they had a beef with Parliament, the Stamp Act, that that's some of the things that they were most angry about. But, you know, I understand also that the king wasn't all powerful, but you're making him seem in completely impotent. He's the head of state, he has the power of the pulpit, and we know the American presidency has the power of the pulpit. Could he not have gone to Parliament and said, bring these people in, let's call them on their bluff and invite them over to be part of this? You're, you're painting him as if he had no power. He might not have been able to dictate, but could not he have used, I mean, those were his troops that were being sent over. He couldn't have went and said, hey, Parliament, let these people in. They want representation since they're paying taxes. Oh, your case is even stronger than you're presenting. The king was one of the great cheerleaders of Parliament. He, in fact, was more intransigent than, than his prime minister, Lord North, who was much more willing to cut a deal with the colonists than the king was. The king was more in, inflamed, more opposed to the colonists than, in fact, Parliament was. My point isn't about his particular view of this issue. My point is about the colonist view of this issue, and it was nonsensical. And it turned to the king, who in fact was not only opposed to them, but even if he weren't opposed to them, which he was. Why he, is it nonsensical? If, if he's giving you the back of his hand, wouldn't you get mad at him? Giving you, wait. Again, the, the point they'd argued for 12 years is they kept asking him. He did give them the back of the hand, but they kept asking for, kiss me. And he slapped them. I mean, our story is that, in fact, we never asked to make out with him. He never slapped us. He, or at least he slapped us before we asked to make out. The truth of the matter is, we wanted kissy kissy. He was the one who refused us, not us refusing him. The story we tell is, we don't like kings. They're bad. We want to be free of kings. No, we want, in fact, to be kissy kissy with the king. And he chose not to. He couldn't have done otherwise, though. Even if he was the king that Americans had sought, kissy kissy king, he could not have done otherwise given the character of British constitutionalism of 1770. You keep saying that it's so nonsensical, it's so um, unbelievable. So either the American colonists were really, really, really stupid, or your theory is wrong. So I was wondering if you could, <laughs> I was wondering if you could cite some specific examples and when the American colonists like were stupid, like a specific speech or an event where sh which shows the stupidity of their theory. John Adams debate with Thomas Hutchinson. Could you say one more time, sorry? What uh, what's the uh, what's the read book? Yeah, it's got it's got the debate. I don't know what it's called, but the um, briefs of the uh, briefs of the American Revolution. Briefs of the American Revolution. Um, that's by far the best. But it's 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 throughout. It's any number of works. It's just that's the one that works. In fact, most carefully articulated. Um, the colonists were. I mean, the problem is is that they actually had a really good relationship in practice. They actually had imperial federalism, and. It was the Parliament's desire to rationalize it and to start transforming it. Then the colonists responded to this attempt at rationalization by creating a, 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 sit, a discourse <coughs> to oppose Parliament's activities. Um, it was, in fact, we were we went through varying stages. Some were less nonsensical than others, but ultimately this was in fact probably the most powerful one, the Dominion Theory, and the one that in fact had the king most wrong, uh, had the theory about the realm of Dominion 
It's, it's, I mean, that's one that's very difficult to, in fact, um, it has to do, were we a conquered people? I mean, it gets to be fairly technical fairly quickly. Um, and so that's why it's avoided. And we like to tell stories about no uh, tax reputation. It's really simple. You can put it on one card. Um, the minion theory was, in fact, uh, not simple. And the, our status under international law, under British domestic law, um, and under natural law wasn't, in fact, straightforward. Um, Blackstone, the theorist that Americans most turned to, uh, in fact, viewed that Americans had no rights, had no English rights, because they were conquered people. Only the king could give them rights, and he, if he chose to. Um, these are issues which are complicated, but my broader point was we did not want a republic. We did not want to uh, turn away from constant monarchy. And that the stories we tell about we hated king, we wanted democracy, are wrong. If Americans were silly or not is another question. And Craig and I disagree. He's much more, is much more supportive and thinks they're not quite so stupid. Um, but that's really not the issue. That's you know, a matter of interpretation, how silly they were in their, in their views. Uh, decades ago, when I was studying history here, uh, I was always told the fundamental dictum of history is before you study the history, you study the historian. It seems as if you have a, a sense that Americans create a fictitious history built upon their own narcissism and need of the moment. Where I, I found this so bewildering, this whole thing, that I would like to know a little bit about your background. You say you came from Berkeley. Can you share your, your political, religious beliefs that might have colored your interpretation of history? Um, I'm not sure that it matters, but um, <laughs> I'm happy to you know, provide that to you. Well, no, but just as we invent our own history according to our desires and needs, cannot the historian? I think they do. I mean, it, it, to, to tell a story about America that is not flattering to America, probably is not a good career path. <laughs> it's a great career path. I've known of no historian in decades that has lost tenure as a result of being negative towards America. Oh, no. It's Almost tenure. all the current historians who are most prominent tell stories that are flattering to America. Um, there, there are some on the left who tell stories about racism, and sexism, and homophobia, and any number of, I mean, the colonists, I mean, it's between Britain and the, and the colonists, who are the more liberal? Who are the more tolerant? Without question, it was the British. Even if so, it's what I don't, it seems like the bottom line is America, oopsie. It's like, what's the oopsie mean? We got here, it was all some kind of mistake that we were misinterpreting. We were fighting the king, not the parliament, and this. I don't know all these details. They're new to me, they're, they're interesting, but the bottom line is, where are you coming from with this? Um, I have a propensity. Uh, I mean, I've been basically working on American colonial and revolutionary history for 30 years. And I've gone through certain iterations. So my first basic time was that um, the general stories that were secular, and my argument is no, most of it America. I remember I, when I wrote my dissertation, I called my mother, who grew up as a Jew in a small town in Minnesota, and I said, I just wrote a dissertation arguing that America is a, is a nation of small town intolerant Christians. And she said, someone gave you a degree for that? <laughs> <laughs> Only in the university could one imagine that that was in fact the story we tell. But no, my mother thought that was silly. She thought, how could anybody who grew up as a Jew in a small town in Minnesota not understand that? Well, almost everyone in the history department, everyone in the political science department, seemingly didn't know much about that in fact America was a nation of small town intolerant Christians. So my first book was basically arguing that this was a Christian nation, but it didn't make it necessarily a nice nation. Um, then I turned to basically work on rights, and I argued that in fact Americans were more interested in English rights than they were in natural rights. Um, they sh shifted in again 1776 when their, nor their original source proved to be no longer valuable. And then later on I started working on the constitutional character of the American um, war for independence or at least leading up to it. And I discovered these guys in the 1920s. These were called the imperial historians. 
and it was like scales fell off my eyes. It was so obvious that they were right, I couldn't understand why I hadn't heard of them before. So, Craig, tell me, why are the imperial historians not more broadly known among uh, historians? I think because they wrote at a time when the progressive school was dominant and people were talking about class conflict. Charles Beard was the, was the dominant historian, and so they were seen as doing this kind of old-fashioned legal constitutional history, which wasn't, at, at that time wasn't cutting edge, right? Well, why do you get lost for the next, more or less the next? Uh, because then again, they'd be like, because I, this is here where we do agree. Then in the 50s, when the, you know, Morgan and those guys come in, I mean, they're not telling a story about republicanism, right? They're not telling a story about liberty and independence, right? They're telling a story about staying in the empire in a, in a restructured way, so. The, the imperial stories. Yeah, the imperial stories are. So I think they've never really hit the zeitgeist. I mean, maybe now they are to some extent, but. Uh, Jack Green. So they're always marginalized. Though. Jack Green, who was, uh, is a friend of mine and was Craig's uh, teacher, uh, wrote in his one of his more recent books about how he couldn't understand why the imperial historians were ignored. Do you remember this part early on? He said it may be because there's some kind of bias that their story wasn't in fact congenial or flattering. I think that is the whole story. We want stories that make us feel good about who we were, who we are, and in some ways the left and right are complicit. They have different versions. So the right's version is that we've fallen away from, in fact, the glory land and we need to return to it. The left's version is that we articulated something perfect and wonderful and never have yet lived up to it. Why can't, why can't we be honest about our history, see warts and all, and also recognize it's a hell of a damn good country? fundamental principles, however we stumbled across them, apparently we got the wrong ones, but they seem to be the finest governments, go governmental system ever created. Well, I, 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 I really don't know of any other country that's done I as much for the planet as ours. <coughs> in every survey about where the best place to live is, it's all British diaspora. It's not just our laws, it's Canada, it's New Zealand, it's, it's Australia, and it's us. Somehow or other, this Protestant, British diaspora has created, in fact, the most congenial uh, set of legal norms, cultural norms the world has known. My only objection is we should have nef never left the British Empire. Why did that spread it off? Just following that idea, just to finish with one idea. You said today if, if we hadn't become American, we'd be Canadian. Why would you say it would be Canadian rather than Nazi? Do you think the Canadians would have stood up against the Nazis? Oh, okay, I got, I got to object to that. We were in the war three years before you guys were. The largest proportion of people who died at D-Day, guess where they came from? Canada. 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 Um, so you referenced Bernard Valen several times and sort of getting it wrong. And I want to ask a question sort of about uh, where he comes from and sort of why you find problems with it. Um, he makes a very, very large <laughs> argument in one of his books that the sort of defining literature of those 12 years, the imperial crisis, was um, in pamphlets. And that's where we should draw most of the where we view that point of view. And his conclusion there is that these people find that there, uh, there is lots of value and importance in um, a republicanism based on the virtue of, of men. Uh, and that's sort of where he, to my understanding, bases his argument in the idea that that's where uh, the ideas for the revolution came from. Um, to, they sort of grew in this 12-year period of, of pamphlet writing because so many people could read and access those. Um, so I just have a two-part question. Is one, do you agree that those are sort of the defining literature of this period? And then two, if you do agree with that, why is he drawing the wrong conclusion from it? Or where is that coming from? Two things. Balin's book is a, uh, a complicated piece of work. It has really, really good bits and really, really bad bits. The bad bit is, is in fact, his thesis. That, in fact, what he was driving them was Commonwealth theory. Uh, the longest chapter in the book is, in fact, simply a reiteration of imperial historians. It's ultimately <coughs> all about constitution. The book is incoherent. Um, you know, this is what you get to do when you're at Harvard. You go write bad books and you become famous. <laughs> <laughs> the book is deeply flawed, but the basic thesis, which is the overarching theory, which can join five different elements uh, that in fact led up to the colonial opposition to Britain, was this idea of Commonwealth theory, which is Republican and parliamentary. I mean, I read the pamphlets too. He, he has almost no evidence 
to support them. But it doesn't matter. We like stories that we find congenial better than ones we find uncongenial. And Balin's book, again, has the fourth chapter is fantastic. The first three suck. And the fourth is, is longer than the first three. And this is basically, he's basically following McElwain. And he even quotes him. An imperial historian, 1924. So, Balin's book is, is uh, I mean, it's now it's its 50th anniversary, and I really want to get to, you know, uh, talk with people, friends of his, is that, you know, Harvard's going to put together his friends. I'd like to put together his not so close <laughs> friends on a panel on this book, which has had so much influence, and in my mind, is so wrong, at least importantly wrong. Uh, in, in light of uh, our revisionist theme for today, uh, would you say that uh, Franklin was being ironic now uh, when he said, a republic, ma'am, if you can keep it? Uh, was he an advocate, or, or was he saying it with an air of resignation? Because that's also part of our creation myth. So if you go to, I mean, if you, for those of you who seminar, part of what went on in the Philadelphia Convention was that how to create a government that could do as best as possible to control what they, in fact, had they could not avoid. It wasn't... The number of people who, in fact, were all gushy about republicanism, Mason, there's a handful of them, mostly older men who were uh, very important in the, in the revolution, but in fact became increasingly disaffected as we move forward towards a constitutional... Do they skewer more north or south, or you can't really draw that distinction? No. I mean, th this is what's ironic. If you look at the Continental Congress, it was the Virginians and, Met and New England that, in fact, were in bed together. Mm -hmm. Um, it would happen with Connecticut and South Carolina later, something similar. Um, I guess they liked being in bed together. But um, this one, in fact, it was Virginia. It wasn't South Carolina. And what they've shared is, I think the Virginians had a secular vision of republicanism closer to Thomas Paine, who nonetheless had a wonderful ability to use uh, basically Christian icons to his use. And New England, I don't think New England ever liked, in fact, monarchy. They basically viewed that as an affront to God. Um, but they were a small part of the, of the Republic, and mostly, how many saw 1776? Musical. I mean, the, Tom, John Adams was viewed as, as a nutcase, um, and he basically thought everybody hated him. Guess what? He's right. <laughs> everyone did, everyone just trusted New England, as, as portrayed pretty accurately in, in the <coughs> musical and movie. Um, they had to be able to win uh, advocates, but Virginia was, I think, I mean, again, Virginia, they may have talked a similar language, but I don't think they meant the same thing. Yeah, so a, a couple of things. I think, I think you're saying in this lecture, as, as far as I could understand that, there's a tragedy that took place in the American Revolution. There's a tragedy that happened uh, at the time itself because of, of a sort of a, 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 a in, in reality, a move away from a parliamentary system or a, a republican to a more of a monarchical sort of uh, affinity, right? The other way around. The other way around, from a, a, from a monarchical to... to, uh, to Can I, can I just to, talk just for a second? Right. Let's keep in mind what a classical understanding of tragedy is. It's not something sad. We've misused the word. Tragedy is when, in fact, you have that you're fated and there are no good choices. It's going to come out the way it's going to come out, and there's nothing much you can do to, in fact, stop it. And there are no good outcomes. I didn't quite get that. <laughs> when I used all the I didn't mean sad. I meant that we didn't want to end up where we are, but the flip side is, there may not have been any way to prevent it. Okay, so uh, two questions. So, so the first one, I, I just, um, I wonder what you make of, of the fact that out of the Philadelphia Convention, uh, in the Constitution, I mean, what do, you, what do you make of the prohibition on non-Republican governments uh, as far as getting everyone to agree at the convention to finally settle on that kind of provision, even though there's this monarchical sentiment that makes up, I would say, a large uh, percentage. And another one is... Um, That's a good question, by the way. Why did they, in fact, 
put a prohibition on any of the states adopting other than a Republican government. Right. Uh, so my second question was uh, is, is sort of incidental, made um, has to do with your your point you made at the beginning um, about so liberalism and republicanism and, and lumping them together. And I don't want to derail the conversation too much here because I, I realize it is incidental, but uh, I'm wondering if you could speak more on, on why you're lumping them together. Is this a development from when you wrote uh, Myth of American Individualism? Because I know there, you know, you talk about tensions within republicanism sort of leading to liberalism or, or helping that shift. Uh, but is that is that a new development in our mind misunderstanding? Because in, in no. that book, you you do I sort of categorically. Wrong. You think you were wrong. Yeah. Okay. I, I think that the differences between I think this liberal Republican debate is is exaggerated. And I think John Locke is the answer. John Locke is in fact was viewed in bo both literatures at times, at least among the the folks who in fact wrote about him, Carolyn Robbins early on. He was counted for both. Because um, he was a common, you know, his parliamentary, his support of parliament was in fact something that pushed him in both directions. I mean, there are people like Alvin and Cindy that only belong in one, Trencher and Gordon, they belong in both. I, I think, I mean, this is a whole other debate as to what degree was that an artificial distinction, um, and I've come to the conclusion. But in my declaration book, I kept them apart. Um, I mean, I think there's still reason to keep them apart, but for different conversations, one can count differently. So yes, they're different, but I don't think it's different as, in fact, the 1980s could have suggested, or 1970s. But back to your first question, because I think that's actually a really tough one. Uh, why is it that they, in fact, insisted that, in fact, all states should have Republican government? I don't have a good answer. Um, my general sense is the Constitution is something of, um, an attempt to, tr I mean, their basic understanding is that Americans would not accept anything other than a government that in fact flattered them, that in fact talked about them having the ability to govern. And as far as I can tell, almost everyone at the Philadelphia Convention, this is not the, the country as a whole, but the elite who were represented in Philadelphia didn't think that in fact people could govern themselves. So their, their challenge was, is how to create a government that allowed people to think they're governing without letting them govern too much. And I think even when you read the Federalist, this isn't hidden. Um, I mean, Federalist 51 basically says there's only two ways to prevent tyranny. There's only two ways to prevent, in fact, the a majority, in fact, going after the minorities or individuals. What's the two ways? Anyone know? Anyone ever read Federalist 51? Most of you have read it but probably never understood it. Most people scientists don't know what they're teaching. I have no idea. Go back and look at Federalist 51. You'll see that there's only two ways that Madison proposes that you can protect individuals and minority rights. Want to, want to guess what the, the first and longest standing way to do so would be? It's by force, right? Monarchy. Monarchy. He has six times, all in strange language, like a force in society that is not of it. But there's six times he says the only way to protect this was in fact a king. Why? Because this is a tradition. I mean, how many of us can understand why anyone ever supported monarchy? How easy is that for us? Was everybody stupid until somehow Tom Paine wrote? Did no one know that kings were frequently, in fact, retarded, vicious, misguided? Somehow no one else figured that out? We have enormous difficulty in understanding monarchy. We have a difficulty in understanding why for 2,000 years it was in fact, after empire, the most common form of government. I don't think our answers are right. I think we've lost a certain sensibility, a certain understanding. And when Madison argues in Federalist 51 there's only two ways to protect people, minorities, obnoxious individuals from majority tyranny, the, he said the f first answer not the best, but the first and longest lived and the only alternative to what he's proposing, which is extending the public and filtering through representation, uh, the system he puts forward in Federalist 10. He says the only alternative is a king. He says, but kings normally do not reflect the, the will of a minority or they do not oppress the majority in the interests of a minority. 
but they may oppress everyone in their own individual interest, he argues as well. But um, we have trouble even thinking about, I mean, this is weird. Something that was so omnipresent for 2,000 years, we can't make sense of except by saying, everyone except us was stupid, or misguided, or confused. Aristotle? I don't think so. I think we just have a difficulty of trying to, in fact, understand why democracy for 2,000 years was viewed as the most dangerous and most difficult form of government. We may be beginning to relearn that. <laughs> the, only, the only thing is, is that we developed a system that could tame democracy through a kind of uh, an engineering feat. We could have our cake and eat it too. We're maybe reaching a point where the promises of Amer the American dream may not be as readily available and democracy may be in fact something that in fact may not be. It. We may discover that everyone is right for 2,000 years and we may discover it very soon. Conflating uh, or, uh, between democratic government and republican government? Isn't there a serious the difference Madison between the sort of uh, basically yeah. sleight of hand? So Madison basically argues in a way which is almost original that republican government is representative government. No, republican government according to Montesquieu, which was the dominant theorist of the time, writing in 1751, republics come in two varieties, democratic republics and aristocratic republics. The idea that republics are not really democracy because they have representation it's sort of an, almost an invention in a sleight of hand of Madison's. But it, it, we, so we can talk about, am I conflating representative democracy and, in fact, direct democracy? That's a more legitimate uh, discrimination. And no, I'm not. I mean, you're right. They're, they're different. But my basic view, and this is if you look at Madison 46, 46, Madison actually knows it too. Every representative democracy, the, the, the representatives are owned by their constituents. They're, uh, they cannot control them. Look at 46. No one reads 10 and 46 together. Do so. 46 will tell you that even Madison knew what had occurred in the, uh, both the Confederation of Congress and every state legislature. The idea that somehow or other that representative democracy would solve the problems of democracy, he did not believe. What he said was, it's the best we can do. But the problem is democracy. They all basically view democracy as a disease that they had to cure, not as a, an answer to a disease. It wasn't monarchy they needed to cure with democracy. It was, it was institutional mechanisms. They, look, America's dilemma was in fact particularly difficult. They, they in fact had none of the, in, the key ingredients for balanced constitutional government. They had no king, no aristocracy. All they had was the people. And the general view at the time was, and the t view for 2,000 years, the people cannot govern themselves without being balanced. Yes, yes but I think this is where you, uh, sorry to uh, cut you off there, but I think this is where your theory might break, that republicanism at the time is celebrated. The most, I mean, after Christianity, the most celebrated tradition at the time are the classics. And the most uh, widely read uh, piece of history at the time is the Roman Republic. I mean, republicanism is celebrated at the time, yeah. not democracy. Uh -huh. I agree with it. Democracy is the mob. I but mean, you're right. Look, there is this, this infatuation with republican virtue. I mean, read Americanus. Read some of the, the pamphlet literature during the, the uh, ratification debate, and the, and they write in the most, I mean, quite amusing way. So we all want, they say, we all want to eat black bread. We all want to basically walk around with iron money. We all want to just eat soup. Is that what we really want? I mean, republicanism had a certain, <coughs> still has. I mean, I'm still attracted to it, this idea of public virtue. But what does public virtue mean? It means self-effacement. It means self-denial. It means surrendering yourself for the common good. And what you have, John Adams writing in 1776, He's all over Republican virtue. He talks about the Christian Republic. Read him in 1786. He says that's bullshit. He says it, ten year, it took 10 years. It took Montesquieu just two, six months in, in Venice to discover how much this was probably bullshit. But it took Adams, he wasn't quite as quick as Montesquieu, to think by 1786 that 
actually he's writing this already by late 1776. Maybe we didn't get this right. Maybe Americans are not as exceptional as we thought. That maybe they're venal, selfish, and do not have the key ingredients. This was the main, at least one of the main, look, the Anti-Federalists were a very complicated group. There wasn't any consensus. They came in all different shapes and sizes. But uh, if there were a central debate between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, is the Federalists who thought that this idea of Republican virtue was total, was total nonsense. And a goodly number, not all, but a goodly number of the Anti-Federalists thought that what they were doing, besides creating an aristocracy, is they were surrendering the key ingredients that made popular government possible. And what was that key ingredient? Po the virtue, political virtue, that individuals would sacrifice themselves for the common good. Is that, do you think that's a realistic assessment or a realistic expectation of any polity or any group of people, you and me, today, then? I mean, this is what, the, the revolution brought, they brought 10 years of experimentation in popular government and, the re, and at least the realization. I mean, uh, there's a book, there's a two volume book by a guy named Heinemann Lutz, and towards the end of it, writing about the 1800s, you have all these guys writing, more or less in the, in the, in the same way they wrote at the end of the Roman Republic. Very disappointed, very, and they all of a sudden discovered we are not who we thought we were, we're not virtuous and which demanded a kind of liberal regime that in fact allowed people to follow their pursuits and try to constrain them from in fact becoming excessive. We were not a nation of in fact Republican virtue. We're a nation that in fact is anything but we were. Maybe New England was different, but it was Christian derived and that lasted what? Halfway Covenant, 1652, it lasted about, f I mean, virtuous regimes are very short lived. The one exception was Sparta lasted 700 years. Why? It had a very limited aspiration. It only wanted to produce two things. Imperviousness to pain and courage. And it was entirely homoerotic, which also helped add to those capacities. But it had no aspiration for virtue beyond that. Justice? No. Magnanimity? No. Just, in fact, courage. But if I could just say one last thing, and this is the last thing I'll say, but um, the, the ideal and the breaking away uh, from uh, the empire based on these ideals, uh, even though they might not have been li uh, lived up to uh, fully, uh, sets the stage for, I think, a spirit in uh, these United States that is, uh, is different and is distinct. And I don't believe in Santa Claus or anything like that, but it's, it's, it's something that uh, I think does uh, have uh, implications, and uh, I think that has to be uh, that. I think that has to be addressed uh, before just saying, "Well, if this didn't happen, we'd all be Canadian." Because I think there is a difference in breaking away based on these well, principles. No, no. Look, I'm not dis disputing that, in fact, the act of the War of Independence caused all kinds of change, mostly that were unintended, in fact, undesirable, from the perspective of those who engaged in it. I mean, was there a discourse, was there a Republican theorist, um, Ethan Allen, um, the people who stole land who were basically terrorists, they were Republicans. Um, who formed the state of Vermont. I mean, was there cafe radicals who believed in this? Yes. They were not the dominant discourse. If you read the Sons of Liberty in Connecticut, they all thought this, but not the people who in fact were the heads of government in a very small and a very egalitarian state. So this discourse existed. Um, I think it's probably closer to what we call certain regimes that in fact occurred in the 1920s and 30s. Um, they're, in, they're intrusive, um, they have public virtue as their aspiration, and most of us probably wouldn't like them. Professor Sainz, I, I must say that I think that you're confusing perfectionism with reality. I must say, as a woman, I would prefer to live under President Trump than the king of Saudi Arabia. I'm sorry, but I, that's not even a comparison to me. So we may not be perfect, and we may not have this altruistic, but it's a sure better world here than it is living in a kingdom. Apparently, I, 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 I said something that, in fact, maybe is a bit misunderstood. I'm not saying that America is good or bad. 
I'm just saying that like many other places, we have founding myths that are untrue, and that maybe if we actually had a better and true understanding, we'd even be a better country. <clears throat> we'd actually know how to respond to certain stimuli, certain emergencies, which now based on a, I can't hear <coughs> a trumped up history, uh, <laughs> may be in fact uh, uh, draw, guided in, in wrong ways. I'm not, I'm not taking sides on a contemporary political debate at all. But I think that that's impossible to say. If you're going to go back to what our founding myth is, of course it's going to have ramifications for the way that we look at our world today. That's what you're questioning, <coughs> the way that we look at our world today. I'm thinking if we tell the truth, maybe it's a good thing. Well, I know I it's a radical that, idea, but that maybe might Maybe the answer is that the truth has many sides. Well, that's true too. I mean, I, I don't mean to be simplistic in saying that there's only a truth, but there still is better and worse history. And I'm not sure we've been committed to better history. We've been committed to useful history. This is a debate that basically, um, I mean, I, I ran a conference basically with, in basically comparing um, Butterfield, which I invited him to, but he basically welched on and had to back out. Um, basically, two views of Butterfield. One is the, the, um, the um, um, help me, uh, the Englishman in his history, 1741 and um, the Whig theory of history, the Whig interpretation of history. Butterfield is a very interesting historian. In the Whig interpretation of history, and Nietzsche does something very similar too, is what's the purpose of history? Is it monumental? Is it to tell the truth? Is it to support a regime? In 1730s, he thought it was the job of historians to tell the truth. In 17, mid, seven, early 1740s, with German bombers over London, he wasn't so sure anymore. Um, I think uh, this is the kind of conversation that it w there's always going to be some people with their hands up, I think, uh, uh, till uh, uh, the next generation of historians comes along. So I, I apologize to those who want to get in now, but uh, I think we should uh, uh, thank Barry Shane for what he said.